work and how uh, our findings help to inform uh, diets, not just here in uh, Canada uh, and uh, North America, but around the world as well. So uh, next slide. Uh, now, uh, I have no competing interest to declare. Uh, shown here are the uh, funding, various funding sources for the PURE study, more than 70 different funding sources in Canada and around the world. And note the external funders and sponsors had no role in the design and conduct of the study in the collection and analysis and interpretation of the data or in preparation, review, and approval of manuscripts for uh, publication. Okay, uh, so next slide. Um, now the uh, current uh, conventional wisdom on diet um, stems largely from the diet heart hypothesis going back to the uh, 1950s from work, work done by Ansel Keys. Uh, and according to the uh, diet heart hypothesis, it postulates that higher fat intake uh, will uh, increase cholesterol levels in the blood and higher cholesterol levels in the blood lead to coronary heart disease. So therefore, according to this hypothesis, if we reduce fat intake in the diet, we'll also reduce coronary heart disease as well. And, uh, and since the work done in the, back in the 1950s, the hypothesis has been tweaked where the emphasis shifted from total fat to saturated fat and from serum, total serum cholesterol to LDL cholesterol. But the basic foundation of the hypothesis remains the same and drives dietary policy right up to this very day. Um, but as it turns out, it doesn't quite work that way. And as you'll, as you'll see, some of the work done in PURE uh, certainly shows that and is consistent with other studies as well. And of course, this hypothesis assumes that fats have no other effects on any other biological systems in the body. And they, they affect only LDL and affect nothing else. But again, as it turns out, it doesn't quite uh, work that way. Now, of course, uh, next slide. Um, the, it's important to note that many food sources of saturated fat are also natural food sources of many other nutrients that the body needs, like high quality protein, uh, monounsaturated fats. For, for instance, a piece of steak contains an equal amount of monounsaturated fat as saturated fat. And of course, we, we know monounsaturated fat is generally recommended like an olive oil, or other uh, things that uh, are generally believed to be heart friendly, uh, various vitamins and, uh, and minerals, uh, and including uh, calcium and vitamin D. And so uh, restricting foods that contain saturated fat may also uh, have unintended consequences in uh, resulting in inadequate intake of nutrients uh, in certain populations, especially populations that um, that have undernutrition, where they, where they um, have difficulty meeting nutrition goals. Next slide. And uh, so to start off, I'll uh, present some of the work we did first uh, back in 2017, published in Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology, where we looked at uh, various uh, dietary nutrients and blood lipids and blood pressure in 18 countries uh, around the world in the PURE study. So I'll tell you now more about PURE. Next slide, please. Uh, now PURE uh, at, back in, in 2017 was comprised of 135,000 uh, people in 667 communities in 18 countries around the world. Um, and these were the first wave countries enrolled into PURE. Since then, we've, had, we've added more countries. But up until that time, uh, 18 countries spanning five continents of the world. And this includes uh, high income countries, middle income and low income countries. And, uh, and PURE also covers five continents. So, um, so, so PURE is a very unique study in that it is a prospective cohort study, but also covers multiple world regions. So very unlike any other study ever conducted. So PURE is very unique. And that's prospective, it's large, and it's global. So it covers broad patterns of diets globally and can answer questions that, have, that we haven't been able to answer in other studies conducted mostly in Western countries. Next slide, please. And here are the countries uh, and regions represented in PURE. Uh, so we have people from uh, South Asia, China, Southeast Asia, Africa, 
North America and Europe, Middle East and South America. Next slide. Now for this particular analysis, it, we focused on the baseline data only. This is a cross-sectional analysis. Uh, pure involved and unbiased selection of people from the general population in 667 urban and rural communities in 18 countries. So these are generally healthy people living in communities uh, around the world, aged 35 to 70 years. They completed country-specific validated food frequency questionnaires. And we collected information on demographics and other lifestyle factors, health history, and, and comorbidities. The outcomes for this analysis were blood pressure, which, where we had data on 125,000 people, blood lipids, 104,000 people, and uh, in a subset of 18,000, we had information on APOB, APOA, and uh, APOB, APOA ratio. And we use standard multivariable linear regression models with random effects uh, to account for clustering by uh, communities in the analysis. Uh, next slide. So, and what we found was uh, we looked at saturated fat versus blood lipids. On the top left-hand corner, you see higher saturated fat uh, is associated with higher LDL cholesterol. But on the top right, you see it's also associated with higher HDL cholesterol, so-called good cholesterol. So when we look at the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL, we find in fact an inverse association where higher saturated fat is related to lower total cholesterol to HDL. Now, of course, the focus of current recommendations is on the top left-hand corner, LDL. But if you focus on other biomarkers, you get a completely different recommendation. And uh, so if we look at the next slide as well, you see that higher saturated fat is also associated with lower triglyceride levels and also associated with lower APOB to APOA ratio. So this would suggest protective associations. So it all depends on what biomarker you look at. If you look at LDL, you would recommend people eat less saturated fat. And uh, if you look at other biomarkers, conversely, you would recommend that people eat more saturated fat. So the point is blood lipids provide conflicting messages on dietary effects. The bottom line is we need studies of clinical events, looking at heart attacks, stroke, cardiovascular events, and mortality. And that's uh, where uh, Pure comes in and helps us to, um, to, to answer that the question on hard outcomes. Also important to note, I just want to point out that if you notice the highest category of saturated fat in this uh, global study is about 12% of energy from saturated fat. So we are by no means um, in the highest intake category, by no means telling people to go and consume unlimited amounts of saturated fat, okay? So this is uh, about what we consume in Western countries, about 11, 12% of energy, um, which is uh, in pure represented by the highest quintile category. In other words, the top 20% of people in the global data set. Just wanted to point that out. It's not showing that you can consume unlimited amounts of saturated fat, but certainly uh, up to about 12% of energy we find is associated with favorable effects on many of the blood lipids. Again, the exception is LDL. So next slide, please. Now there's been uh, meta-analyses of saturated fat and coronary heart disease. Uh, the focus of the diet heart hypothesis has always been on coronary heart disease. So this is a meta-analysis by Siri Torino in 2010 of prospective cohort studies of saturated fat and coronary heart disease. When you pull the data across studies, you see that on the uh, lower part of the figure, you see the summary estimate, it is statistically neutral. So no association between saturated fat and coronary heart disease in prospective cohort studies. Uh, and then we go to the next slide we see that um, saturated fat appears to be associated directionally with a, with a protective effect against stroke. And this has been shown in a number of cohort studies, uh, as you can see here. And, and generally, many studies that look at dairy, uh, dairy intake also find protective associations with stroke. So this is um, something that needs more exploration as to why uh, this is the case. Uh, I'm not sure we really understand the mechanisms, but this, this is an observation that's been observed uh, across uh, a number of cohort studies. 
And of course, the, the focus of the original diet heart hypothesis was on coronary heart disease, uh, but there was no um, really uh, story on stroke. And we know stroke is very common in many parts of the world. In fact, in some parts of the world, like China, it's even more common than, uh, than heart attacks. So this is a, an important point that uh, stroke is every bit as important as MI. So next slide. And in a more updated re, re, uh, meta-analysis of cohort studies of saturated fat, looking at various outcomes, we see that the results, again, when you pull the data across studies, the results are generally neutral. This is looking at all-cause mortality, coronary heart disease, and cardiovascular mortality, coronary heart disease, ischemic stroke, and type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. And uh, there also have been randomized trials of saturated fat, uh, many of them older trials going back to the late 60s and early 70s, where they replaced saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat in these trials. So a direct test of the diet heart hypothesis. And here you see the summary estimates of various meta-analyses um, of saturated fat versus coronary heart disease. And you could see that in these meta-analyses, the results are generally neutral. So whether you focus on observational studies or randomized trials, again, the results are pretty uh, neutral for saturated fat, despite uh, the common belief that uh, there's strong evidence of saturated fat related to coronary heart disease. Next slide. Okay, so that brings us to the um, first of our papers looking at um, nutrient intake and cardiovascular events and mortality. Again, this is the same data set uh, as the previous paper I showed, only this time looking at the perspective associations with future uh, cardiovascular events and strokes in the 18 countries around the world. This paper was published in The Lancet in 2017 and was ranked the um, first by the digital science in their annual altimetric top 100 research papers of the year in 2017. In other words, it was, it was the most discussed paper on social media back in 2017. So next slide. Um, it, now again, looking at the perspective analysis of the pure data, uh, which at that time uh, was 7.4 years of follow-up. Note that we, for this analysis, we have more than 4,700 major cardiovascular events and 5,700 total deaths. We use standard multivariable Cox frailty analyses with uh, study center as, as a random uh, intercept. Next slide. Uh, here you see uh, the risk of mortality by different types of fat. At the top, you have saturated fat, and monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fat. So notice with each type of fat, comparing the lowest quintile to the, to the higher quintiles, we see a graded association between each type of fat and a lower risk of mortality. So each type of fat was showed protective association all the way up to the highest quintile. Um, notice saturated fat, the highest quintile category is about 13% of energy from saturated fat. So again, roughly what we consume in Western countries, up to that average intake in Western countries, we see a protective association versus risk of mortality. Again, uh, we're not showing that an unlim unlimited amount of saturated fat is healthy, but certainly up to what we eat here in North America appears to be safe and, and protective in, uh, as well. So um, generally different types of fats were found to be protective. So next slide. Uh, here we see the risk of cardiovascular disease and non-cardiovascular disease death by type of fat. On the left, looking at cardiovascular death, we see each type of fat, again, associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease death. And directionally, they're all toward a protective association. On the right, we see even more clear cut, a protective association, association against non-cardiovascular death. Uh, so in pure, non-cardiovascular death around the world is mostly uh, cancer, uh, but also includes uh, respiratory disease, and uh, uh, kidney disease and, uh, and, other, uh, and other outcomes as well. But it's mainly, mainly cancer and respiratory disease. So we see a protective association. Now, uh, as we accrue more events during follow-up, 
we can explore this further and look at associations with each individual type of non-cardiovascular disease death. But we need more events for that to get more statistically uh, meaningful information to look at those associations. So next slide. Now, carbohydrate intake was um, generally showed a positive association where higher carbohydrate intake was associated with increased risk of mortality. However, the uh, association was pretty neutral up to about 60% of energy, but then at higher levels of carbs, we see a clear increase in risk. Certainly, um, a moderate amount of carbohydrates uh, was associated with the lowest risk. Um, now, some of the, the the low carb crowd took the pure study as proof that low carb is the way to go, but we but there weren't enough people in, with low carbohydrate intake to make conclusions on that because most of the people had between a moderate amount of carbs and a high intake of carbs uh, in the diet as represented in pure. Very few people had low carb intake to be able to assess the effects of low carbs versus moderate carbs but certainly high carbs are associated with increased mortality. So next slide. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you more about carbs uh, in a few, uh, um, a few slides later, but just to go over some of the strengths and limitations of, of PURE. Um, of course, the strength is the perspective design, and the fact that PURE is very large and covers five continents representing diverse diets globally. Uh, we use standard and validated methods to measure diet using country-specific food frequency questionnaires, and we extensively adjusted for both dietary and non-dietary covariates. We had information on all known confounders and extensively adjusted for them in the analyses. So we did everything that's humanly possible to adjust for confounding in an observational study. Next slide. The limitations are uh, random measurement error in the assessment of diet, which may dilute real associations for the null. Uh, high carbohydrate intake and low fat diets may be a proxy for poverty, especially in some of the lower income countries. Now to minimize confounding by economics, we adjusted for uh, education, income and wealth index. And we also included study center as a random intercept, which accounts for clustering. So by including study center as a random intercept, what you're doing is you're looking at associations within countries and even more finely within centers rather than across countries. So this is not, here is not a comparison across countries. Um, it, it is a comparison within countries because we adjust for the clustering effect of associations that occur across countries by including study center as a random intercept. So that's important to emphasize this is not an ecological study. This is a study uh, of using individual level data and accounting for clustering that occurs um, within, within countries. And, uh, and then we also conducted subgroup analyses by region, which, which also addresses the issue of confounding by geography. And of course, as we get more events uh, with the ongoing follow-up, we'll be able to look at subgroup, subgroups with more precision going forward. Of course, subgroup analysis, you get uh, the data spread across um, more finely, so you end up with wider confidence intervals. So as with the ongoing follow-up, uh, we'll be able to get more precise estimates by region. Now, um, there are fewer events within countries and region, yeah, as I mentioned, so that's something we can address with the ongoing follow-up as mentioned. Okay, next slide. Now, fruit, vegetable, and legume consumption, uh, in a paper published in The Lancet, uh, we looked at uh, fruit, vegetables, and legumes versus mortality and cardiovascular disease. Next slide. Generally, for both mortality and major cardiovascular disease, we see a graded association with lower risk with a, with a maximal benefit for up to about three to four servings of fruit, fruits, vegetables, and legumes per day. And then the risk is constant with higher intake, up to about eight servings of fruit, vegetable, and legumes per day. So about three to four servings per day appears to be the amount uh, associated with maximum benefit, and then the risk is constant. On the right, for major cardiovascular disease, we see a similar trend, but the um, result is not as clear cut. We see a more modest association for, for major CVD. Uh, not shown here, we found that uh, raw vegetables were better than cooked vegetables. 
and fruit in general was uh, more protective than vegetables. I think largely because of the effects of cooking on, um, on the uh, protective association for vegetables. Uh, next slide, please. So it's an important point that our finding of higher carbohydrates being associated with higher mortality, it's not uh, driven by fruits, vegetables, or legumes because fruits, vegetables, and legumes are generally protective. So that suggests other aspects of carbohydrate intake were associated with harm that, that we uh, needed to explore further, further, and which we did, and I'll show you in the few slides. Uh, fats, including saturated and unsaturated fats, are associated with lower mortality, and there's no association between total fat, types of fat, and cardiovascular events. So the current advice to limit total fat to less than 30% of energy and saturated fat to less than 10% of energy is not supported by these global data. So next slide. Now, uh, we saw that carbohydrates are associated with harm. And this slide, you see, you see refined grains and whole grains versus health outcomes. This is in another paper published this year in, in the British Medical Journal. On the left, you see the associations of refined grains with, for, uh, at the top, we have mortality. And at the bottom, we have major cardiovascular disease. You see that for both outcomes, we see an association between, between higher refined grain intake and risk of mortality and major cardiovascular disease, all the way up to the highest intake category of 350 grams per day. So refined gra gra uh, grains were found to be associated with harm. On the right, we have the results for whole grains. And note that overall, we see generally a neutral association. Higher grains were neither protective nor harmful. Um, this is actually not uh, surprising. If you look at the, there have been a number of meta-analyses done on whole grains, and generally the effects are modest uh, or neutral. So this is not something out of the ordinary. Contrary to popular belief that whole grains are protective, generally the, the protective association that's found when you look at the data collectively, it's really quite modest and oftentimes neutral. And there's a lot of heterogeneity across studies. And if anybody's interested, you can um, email me and I could send you some uh, references and meta-analyses of whole grain intake. Okay, and then uh, another paper published this year, in the next slide, yeah, thank you. Um, but in a paper led by uh, David Jenkins, published in the New England Journal this year, um, we found that glycemic index was associated with higher risk of uh, mortality and to a lesser degree, major cardiovascular disease. And uh, all the way up to the highest quintile, we see a hazard ratio 1.35 for mortality in graded association with mortality and, uh, and for major CVD as well, but though for CVD, it was more modest. So uh, glycemic index, um, is consistent in, uh, in a number of studies showing a, a um, harmful association with uh, cardiovascular outcomes and mortality. Uh, so again, it's the, it's the quality of the carbohydrate that is important. It's, uh, so fruits, vegetables, and legumes were found to be protective. Whole grains were neutral, whereas refined grains were harmful. Glycemic index found to be harmful. So uh, this strongly suggests that Carbohydrate quality is really what we need to focus on. You could you 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 can include carbs as part of a healthy diet, but they have to be good carbs. And that's really, I think, the message here. So next slide. Uh, nuts were found to be protective. So higher nut nut consumption up to 125 grams were associated with a lower risk of uh, the composite outcome of death or cardiovascular disease a lower risk of mortality and lower risk of major cardiovascular disease. So that's, a, that's about one serving of nuts per day uh, or about 120 grams per week uh, associated with lower risk of uh, mortality and cardiovascular disease. This is con pretty consistent with the literature, I think. And next slide, we looked at egg consumption. This is another paper published just last year in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Um, we, what we found was that on the left side, we see the data from Pure, and I told you about Pure, generally healthy people. 
On the right is data from on target and transcend. These are observational data from the clinical from a clinical trial of patients with vascular disease. So on the left is generally healthy people, on the right is people with vascular disease. We see that generally in both populations, uh, the associations are mostly neutral. So eggs are associated with neither harm nor benefit, which suggests that eggs can be part of a, a part of your healthy diet. You, you can include some eggs and certainly won't be harmful. Uh, and of course, eggs offer a, um, a source of good quality protein and a variety of uh, nutrients that um, are largely beneficial. So eggs are, are fine. Um, I think that you could include them in your diet. Uh, and now we get into the next slide where we look at um, dairy intake and clinical outcomes. So we published two uh, major papers on dairy and outcome events from Pure. This one here was uh, published in The Lancet in 2018 where we looked at total dairy intake and the uh, composite outcome of death or cardiovascular disease, mortality, and major cardiovascular disease. It's important to point out that in Pure, um, dairy intake was mostly whole fat dairy intake, except for North America and Europe, which was more evenly balanced, but in other parts of the world, dairy intake was mostly represented by whole fat dairy. And that's an important point to keep in mind going forward. Uh, and what we found was higher dairy consumption up to about uh, two servings per day or higher was associated with lower risk of the composite outcome, lower risk of mortality, and lower risk of major cardiovascular disease. So about a 20% lower risk of outcome events, 15 to 20% lower risk of outcome events with, by consuming two servings of dairy per day compared to people who consumed uh, little or no dairy. So dairy was found to be protective. Uh, next slide. We looked at the different types of outcomes, non-cardiovascular death, uh, cardiovascular death, uh, myocardial infarction, and stroke. We see protective associations for each, especially for stroke. We see at the bottom, a very clear cut uh, protective association and also dose responsive uh, and with about a 35% lower risk in those with the highest intake compared to those in the lowest, lowest intake. So again, like other studies, it appears that whole fat dairy is largely protective against stroke. Next slide. We looked at, uh, it, then we looked separately whole fat dairy versus whole fat plus low fat. And you could see on the left where we look at whole fat alone, we see a more clear-cut protective association with, with each type of outcome. And the associations are in a graded fashion all the way up to higher dairy intake of uh, exceeding two servings per day. On the right, where we look, where we include low fat together with whole fat, again, we see protective associations, but they're not nearly as strong and dose responsive. So it appears that whole fat is uh, really what drives the protective association. And we go to the next slide. We, and we looked at different types of dairy foods. Uh, so yogurt and uh, milk uh, were both found to be protective. Again, all the way up to a serving per day of each was associated with lower risk of the composite outcome, mortality, and major cardiovascular disease. Cheese was also protective, but it, it was not statistically significant. Uh, and then next slide, uh, we did subgroup analyses by region looking at uh, regions that consume a low amount of dairy and regions that consume a high amount of dairy. This helps to address the issue of confounding by geography, because now largely you're restricting within regions where, for instance, there's lower, um, um, lower access to care, uh, lower, lower socio so socioeconomic variables, et cetera, that may confound results. But you could see that even when you restrict within region, we see a similar pattern of results where higher dairy intake up to um, two servings per day was associated with lower risk. So there's every indication that there is a protective association and it's not confounded by geography. Next slide. Now in another paper, this one published in BNJ Open Diabetes Research Care, 
in 2020, uh, we looked at uh, whole fat dairy intake and lower risk of hypertension and diabetes. On the left, looking at whole fat plus low fat dairy. On the right, whole fat dairy alone. Um, at the top is uh, incident hypertension. At the bottom is incident diabetes. You see that with um, throughout, we see a, generally a pattern suggesting a protective association of higher intake, up to two servings a day, associated with a lower risk of hypertension and a lower risk of diabetes. However, if you look at the results on the right, it, uh, it appears that the effect is consistent in whole fat dairy, you see a protective association. Whereas when you look at low fat dairy alone, uh, the results were, were more modest, not shown in the figure here, but when we isolated uh, low fat dairy, we see that the results are closer to being neutral. So it appears that whole fat is really the driver of the protective uh, association that we see for dairy with regard to incident hypertension and, and diabetes. Certainly the hypertension result is consistent with the DASH trial, with the original DASH trial in 1997, uh, where we know that um, uh, uh, dairy added to fruit and vegetable diet uh, doubled the blood pressure lowering effect compared to a control diet. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so to conclude, higher dairy intake mainly from whole fat is associated with a lower risk of mortality, cardiovascular disease, especially stroke, hypertension and diabetes uh, with, with higher dairy intake. So dairy was found to be protective. Now, next slide, uh, what about meat? For, uh, for example, unprocessed red meat and poultry. So, while we, so we looked at that in a paper just published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. On the left, focusing on unprocessed red meat, you could see from the cubic spline, uh, higher unprocessed red meat up to 250 grams per day was generally associated with a protective association with against mortality though the result was not statistically significant. You could see the confidence interval just barely overlaps with, with the um, 1.0 hazard ratio uh, line shown there. So it suggests uh, that it's not statistically significant, but generally it trends toward a protective association, again, all the way up to 250 grams per day. On the right for poultry, we found uh, completely a neutral association. So no association between poultry and mortality. Um, we look at cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, the results were uh, generally neutral for both. So um, the take home message here is meat can be included uh, in as part of a healthy diet, certainly, doesn't, certainly no indication of harm. Uh, and remember in many parts of the world, there's um, uh, 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 potential for undernutrition and certainly uh, eating meat or increasing meat intake in places where consumption is close to zero certainly won't uh, lead to any harm uh, based on these data. Now, processed meat, we found the positive association where higher processed meat intake was associated with a higher risk of mortality. <clears throat> so certainly processed meat intake should be consumed in uh, moderation considering these data, as well as other studies as well. I think that I've, I've shown this too. So uh, this led, go to the next slide, to a central hypothesis. Uh, we hypothesized that non-communicable diseases globally may be caused by a diet com comprised of low amounts of several natural or minimally processed foods, including fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and fish, but also low amounts of dairy and uh, perhaps even unprocessed meats. Now, generally recommendations uh, focus on the first five foods listed here, fruit, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and fish. Uh, so we deduce that uh, dairy and unprocessed meats being added to that might even be more protective. And so we investigated that further and our goal was to come up with a global dietary score. So there's many different scores out there like the Mediterranean diet, the, the, the DASH diet, the alternative healthy eating index. We wanted to come up with a score that has, that is more globally applicable, considering that we have data from uh, around the world. So if we go to the next slide, we looked at uh, six large international studies, uh, 244,000 people in 80 countries around the world. 
And we had data from Pure, I already uh, talked about Pure, generally healthy people uh, around the world, a prospective cohort. We also had data from On Target, Transcend, and Origin, uh, collectively about 43,000 people. This is mostly uh, patients with vascular disease. So unlike Pure, uh, people with, with uh, vascular disease, whereas Pure is generally healthy people. And then we also had two case control studies, interheart and interstroke, case control studies of heart attacks and stroke respectively. So note the large number of events that we had uh, collectively from each of these studies and note that uh, Pure is global, on target and transcend and origin are uh, North and South America, Europe and Asia, while interheart and interstroke are largely uh, global. So collectively, we have a large number, of, large number of events and can look at broad patterns of diet globally. Next slide. So uh, based on foods that were found to be protective or, or associated with lower risk of mortality, we came up with a diet score where uh, we included vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, fish, and dairy, which was, which was mainly whole fat dairy as mentioned. And so the more that people consume these foods, the higher their diet score. And the scoring scheme was very simple. Each, each food receives a score of zero or one based on if consumption is above or below the median in the global population. So if you're above the median, you get a score of one. If you're below the median, you get a score of zero. Then you simply add up all the food components to get a maximum score of six, and a minimum score of zero, where six is the highest quality diet and uh, zero is the lowest quality diet. And uh, this is data presented at the European Society of Cardiology meeting in Germany in 2018. Uh, so on this slide here, you see median intake of the different food components in Pure, 147,000 people. Uh, take home message here is that you look at, um, Overall, you see the median intake of collectively of all the different um, food components. It's almost 600 uh, grams per day. But what you see is marked variation across regions. Uh, North America, South America, and Middle East have generally higher consumption of the food components included in the diet score. By contrast, South America, China, Southeast Asia, and Africa have lowest intakes of these food components. So in other words, higher diet quality scores are found in some of the richer countries like North America, Europe, South America, and Middle East, whereas Southeast Asia, China, and Southeast Asia and Africa have the lowest uh, diet score, meaning that they're consuming less of these protective foods. And that's really a key uh, point here. Next slide. So what does a high and low diet, pure diet score look like? So here, just for the interest of uh, just simplifying the message as much as we can, I just simply uh, created a table where we put the intake values in the lowest and highest quintile of the healthy diet score. Uh, in the lowest quintile, you see that fruit and vegetable intake was low, only one serving per day. Nut and legumes was 0.4 servings. Dairy was only 0.3 servings. Red meat was 0.2, fish was 0.2. This is largely a carbohydrate, high carbohydrate diet. Almost 70% of energy was carbs, less than 20% fats and 12% protein. By contrast, people in the highest category of the diet score consumed uh, four to five servings of fruits and vegetables, a serving and a half of nuts and legumes, two servings of dairy, one serving of red meat, uh, 0.3 servings of fish, and note the carbohydrate intake, 54% of energy, uh, more, more an all around balanced diet, which includes both fats and carbs. Uh, so this is not a keto diet, it's not a low carbohydrate diet. It's a normal diet uh, with about a moderate amount of carbs and a moderate amount of fats. Well, th fats about 30% of energy and protein about 18%. So uh, the all around uh, higher healthy diet score is an all around balanced diet, including a variety of foods uh, with uh, a moderate amount of carbs and fats. So next slide. So I think we'll skip this one in the interest of time because it's summarized more better in the next slide. 
Uh, here we see the pure diet score across four prospective studies, 191,000 people. So note the different outcomes, total mortality, major cardiovascular disease, and the composite outcome of death of cardiovascular disease. So across studies, pure, on-target, transcend, origin, and overall, for each type of, for each outcome event, event we see a protective association. Every, all the estimates are to the left of the line, suggesting a protective association uh, with about approximately a uh, seven to eight percent lower risk per 20 percent increment in the diet score. This is consistent in uh, across different studies, consistent in generally healthy people and in people with vascular disease, and consistent across all the different uh, studies. So there's good consistency of the diet score in different populations. Next slide. And this is uh, an important slide here because what we find is that on the left, you see the cubic spline of the diet score versus the risk of the composite outcome of death or cardiovascular disease in that the, the association is nonlinear. So you get a much steeper slope at the lower end of the diet score. And then the, and then the curve flattens out at the higher end of the diet score, meaning that uh, it's very important to get people with low diet scores up to a, about a moderate diet score, up to about three or four. Uh, going from zero to one, up to three to four, you get big bang for your buck in improving the diet score there. Now, further improvement in the diet score uh, in people who already have a diet score of say four results in very little additional improvement in uh, health outcomes. So, um, in places around the world where the diet score is very low, it's important to get those populations up to moderate diet score levels. And this also suggests that there's a lot of undernutrition around the world. There's a low intake of these foods in many parts of the world. So uh, largely the focus in dietary guidelines has been overnutrition in Western countries. But I think globally, the bigger problem is undernutrition around the world. And that's a key message. On the right, this is further supported by the subgroup analysis of countries that are low income, middle income, and high income. You see in all regions, there's a protective association, higher diet score related to lower risk, but the associations is, is much stronger in the lower income region than the higher income region. Again, supportive of a possible undernutrition in some parts of the world especially in poorer countries with gro lower gross national incomes. So very important to improve diet scores uh, to get to these populations up to a diet score of four or higher. Next slide. Similar results were found in the two case control studies, interheart and interstroke, where a diet score uh, in the highest quintile uh, associated with about a 25% lower risk of heart attack and stroke respectively. So there's consistency across studies, across populations and across different study designs and, uh, in, and in people with uh, vascular disease and without vascular disease, which uh, reaffirms the validity or accuracy of the, of the diet score. Now, uh, next slide, a lot of people have been asking what happens when you include red meat or what happens when you include uh, whole grains? So in this slide, we see where, if you include or exclude red meat, you see you get generally similar results. Um, where adding red meat to the score uh, results in similar associations between the score and the composite outcome, suggesting that you could include red meat in the score, uh, uh, red meat as part of your, your, your diet and still uh, follow an all around healthy diet, uh, provided it's a moderate amount of red meat. And certainly it could be included as part of an all around healthy diet. We found similarly for whole grains, if you include whole grains, again, we see the results are similar. So you can um, tweak the, the diet score to suit the population or the individuals according to their preferences. If you're a vegetarian, you could include whole grains. And if you're a meat eater, you could include red meat and it could be all part of an all around healthy diet. The key is variety, focusing on, on different foods, a variety of foods, all in moderate amounts. And that really is the key to, to a healthy diet based on these data. So to conclude, the pure healthy diet score comprised of these foods are associated with lower risk globally. 
Uh, there's consistency across uh, six international studies involving 244,000 people in 80 countries. There's consistency in people with, uh, with prior cardiovascular disease and without cardiovascular disease. Some elements of the score, such as whole fat dairy, differs for, from current advice on earlier studies and perform mostly in high income countries. So there's always that assumption that what we find in high income countries is applicable globally, and that's not necessarily the case. So to conclude, uh, here's what a uh, healthy diet looks like based on the pure data. And uh, contrary to um, uh, some of the social media um, uh, work out there, uh, the findings are generally consistent with the literature. There, there really isn't anything here that jumps out as being contrary to, to the literature. So, uh, so pure often, uh, gets criticized. Uh, uh, I think uh, it, the carb finding back in 2017 has been the focus of a criticism for pure. But really, as you could see here, overall, collectively looking at different foods, there's no basis for, for that criticism from the standpoint of consistency with other studies. So there's, not, there's not anything here that jumps out as being unusual. Um, that's my perspective anyway, but happy to hear other people's thoughts. And I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll open it up for uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andrew. That, that was fantastic. Uh, I, I really commend you and your, and your co-authors for a truly impressive uh, body of work. And, and I know that's that's ongoing. I mean, you, you have uh, people in the audience today who are uh, uh, proper nutritionists, uh, others who are epidemiologists, and, uh, and others who are uh, trying to, you know, bridge between the two, or and and, and so on. But I, I think lots there to uh, uh, to provide uh, lots of great food for thought. Sorry, no pun intended. But uh, um, uh, just just a really impressive body of work. And and thank you for uh, for taking the time to. Uh, virtually come up highway six to uh, uh, to, to your uh, <laughs> colleagues and future colleagues in Guelph. So with that, um, we do have a few minutes for questions and and I'll uh, I'll go ahead and open this up. We're, we're not a huge group. So if you want to type your question into the chat, that's fine. Uh, or I'll, I'll even be uh, either brave or foolish and say, just go ahead and unmute yourself and um, and ask your question. To kick us off, I see the first one uh, from from Doug, who's asking with regard to saturated fat and whole fat dairy. That the the message, uh, presumably sort of uh, negative message, has been around for about a decade. Why can't we turn the corner with respect to public health policy? Um, in particular, Canada's new food guide. <laughs> Is Health Canada listening? There, there's some really easy questions just to start things off. Yeah. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, say, I think anything that, uh, that really challenges conventional thinking uh, really takes a long time to result in change. And, um, you, you know, the, uh, certainly PURE is not the only study showing that saturated fat certainly is not harmful and may even be protective. You see that the, the uh, whole fat dairy analyses are very, very strong. And other studies as well have shown that, other perspective studies. So uh, collectively, I think it, it takes time for um, this to translate into real change. Um, it, it's, it's tough because there's also the political aspects, you know, of trying to, to there's movements of trying to get us to consume less animal foods. Uh, there's the planetary considerations. Um, we believe that that's a separate debate. Uh, we're doing our best to simply address the health impact. Certainly from a health standpoint, there's no basis to uh, restricting dairy and whole fat dairy and restricting saturated fat to low levels. Now, other are people are, can, can debate the other aspects um, of personal choice, um, moral choice, uh, morally based choices or, or, or planetary uh, uh, rationale, but I think I'll leave that to, to other people to debate. Certainly those are challenges in, uh, in getting um, guidelines to, uh, to reflect the evidence based on health findings. And that, that is a challenge, yeah. Great, thanks, Andrew. Others? Uh, 
Um, I'll uh, I'll ask one at this point. Uh, so, I, as I understand it, Pure is is still ongoing. Is is that right? And 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 if so, what's what's next? What other questions do you do you still want to tackle with this uh, this huge body of data? Yeah, we we hope to co to continue Pure for at least another five years, uh, if not ten years. Uh, that will give us um, an uh, about twenty years of follow up. If we can go ten years, um, at an additional ten years. Uh, so certainly we, we've gone 10 years up to now, which we hope to add to that. And what happens is if you continue the follow-up, say over the next five years, the event rates of the different outcomes will go up exponentially because as the cohort is aging, you'll get more and more events and that will that allow give us more power to do a number of uh, questions that could be answered. So that's very important to con continue the follow-up. Of course, that's contingent on funding. Um, and uh, the next really frontier, I think, and we're, we're moving into that area as well, is, look, is bringing in some of the newer methods like metabolomics, genomics, proteinomics, so that we can better understand uh, the uh, intermediates of the, from di the dietary assessment information, relating them to biomarkers and from there to clinical events. Because when, when we have association based on self-reported dietary information, there's always the concern you know, of uh, regiment, measurement error, confounding, et cetera. But if we have information on biomarkers and genetic information, for example, to do Mendelian randomization analyses, that would provide a stronger uh, basis for making causal inferences and certainly provide more coherent uh, coherence in the argument for causation. So that I think is the next frontier. A lot of uh, people are moving toward uh, doing that. And, um, and of course, the other option is to do randomized controlled trials. Now, we're, we're not uh, currently planning to do a randomized trial on diet, but I think um, if, if the question often people ask is what is needed to, to elicit change in, in, in policy, randomized controlled trials uh, are, very, uh, are very, very powerful in doing that. But the problem, with the challenge with randomized trials is how hard to get people, of course, to eat a particular diet for many, many years. And that's really the challenge. And so random, long-term randomized trials are very few, if ever done. So really, the, the, in the absence of that, we have to rely on the observational data and the new methods that, that I mentioned and, uh, and see if we can build on that. Yep, oh, that's great. Could, could I, uh, I'll, I'll... Since you're being such a good sport here, um, uh, as you know, in, in broad strokes, not, not specific to pure, um, uh, what, get dubs, what gets dubbed nutritional epidemiology often comes in for criticism, especially based on uh, um, uh, you know, people's food uh, diaries and, and, and so on in terms of recall bias and, and, and other types of bias. And so I'd just be interested in getting you to comment because this is you know, massively ambitious work and across lots of cultures and countries and moving parts and so on. So um, just ask you to talk for a minute about, about how you tackled um, getting good data on that, that really critical piece of uh, your uh, prediction data. Yeah, it's a common criticism that comes up about, you know, food frequency questionnaires, but really it's the best tool we have right now for large scale studies. It's just not feasible to do seven day food diaries in a large population global study of 150,000 people in all uh, regions of the world. Uh, just not feasible, it's never gonna happen. So, uh, you know, the, 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 you do what's, what's humanly possible. So you do the food frequency questionnaire for now. And as I said, uh, the next frontier would be new methods. Uh, of course, the biomarkers would be very important. And, um, and, and so there's not really one design or one methodology that, that, uh, that arrives at truth, it's a complementary approach using different study designs and different methods. Um, and I think of different studies as complementing one another. Each study is a, is a piece in the mosaic tile of the big picture. So, uh, so uh, we have to remember that. And, uh, and, and of course, with all its limitations, with frequency, frequency questionnaires, I would like to point out in Pure, for instance, when we did the, the uh, blood lipids analysis, the associations of the various nutrients with the blood lipids went in the expected direction. So for example, saturated fat was related to higher LDL. We know that that's the case, right? We, we, we know that from a number of studies, uh, and, uh, but also related to lower triglycerides and lower HDL. 
which we which which has been shown in in intervention studies. Um, the effects are modest, uh, and and trials have shown that as well. You don't get big increases in LDL; it's a modest increase. But directionally, you could see the association consistent with what we know, which reaffirms generally the accuracy in using the frequency questionnaire to stratify the population to broadly classify people into intake categories so that we could look, look at associations with events. Is it perfect? No, uh, but generally uh, it's, it's pretty good. And again, we, as we supplement it with new methods that would help to inform us better going forward. Great. Um, a couple more questions, if uh, if you're game. Um, so a compliment uh, that that came in uh, for for the work that you've done, and also uh, asking if you would comment on the criticism that some people make regarding um, dietary saturated fat, specifically if, if when you isocalorically re replace saturated fat with other macronutrients such as um, mono or polyunsaturated fatty acids or whole grains. Um, that that substitution is in fact beneficial. So, so it is, it, I think if I'm paraphrasing a little, can you, can you reconcile or at least comment on, on those, those different observations? Yeah, so the observational studies generally show that when you model the replacement, statistically model the replacement of saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat or monounsaturated fat, you get a lower risk as you replace saturated fat with poly or mono fat. Um, now, statistically modeling that in an observational study is not the same as experimentally replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fat. So you look at the randomized trials that actually did that, the results are neutral. I mean, I, I put up the one of the slides, six meta-analyses versus coronary heart disease where they replaced saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, the results were neutral. And another very good meta-analysis by Hamley subdivided the trials that were well-controlled with the trials that were not well-controlled. And you could see the ones that were, that were well-controlled, clearly the results are neutral. In fact, directionally even favoring saturated fat, but we conclude statistically neutral. So uh, what you find in the observational studies is not quite supported by the, by the randomized trial. And that should be kept in mind in that because um, one thing is re replacing it statistically, the other one is replacing it experimentally. In pure, the problem with doing replacement analyses is that when you do a substitution analysis, you're assuming in your model that the associations are all linear. And in a data set like pure, like you saw the carbohydrate curve, it's not linear. It's in fact pretty flat up to about 60% of energy and then it goes up. And that's the thing, when you look at global data across a broad range with big numbers like impure, you get nonlinear associations. So one of the key assumptions when you do these regression models is you assume linearity and you don't necessarily get that impure. So this was a challenge. And so we, we conducted some preliminary substitution analyses where we found that they were non-informative and we didn't report them. Um, and they didn't really give any clear cut answer as to what the replacement does. So, um, uh, but in general, uh, the observational studies do show uh, that replacement is beneficial, but that's not supported by the trials. Great, yep, well, that's some really good uh, points there. Both for the, yeah, m methods matter, both, both in terms of the data analysis and, uh, and the underlying nutrition and, and, and biochemistry. Um, maybe just one last one, Andrew. Um, that also uh, came in here a moment ago, uh, and this is just uh, to get you to comment on, on methodology um, about um, uh, how frequently you collected the, the dietary data in the various populations and what, what uh, magnitude of losses to follow up you have. Of, uh, I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, but what kind of dropout rates for, for uh, people out of the study? Yeah, great questions. Uh, dropout, dropout rates were low. One of the uh, major strengths of PURE is uh, follow-up information complete on 95% of our participants, exceeding 95% of participants. So that was, is uh, excellent and obviously very important. Um, for the dietary assessments, we did the baseline assessment. Um, and up to now, we have not completed a follow-up assessment. Now, uh, a lot, uh, a story has been made about this, uh, that uh, you need repeat dietary assessments. And uh, a few people point to the, some of the work done in the nurses health study or 
health professional follow-up study. But I'm not so sure that, that really the evidence is strong that you need repeat dietary assessments. Everybody just repeats it. You know, that you hear that, 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 that it's needed. If you look at the EPIC study, and I have a reference on this, if anybody wants it, I can, I can send it to you, Stephen, and if, if you want to share it, where they showed um, after seven years of follow-up, I think it is, uh, where they did a repeat dietary assessment in EPIC, and then they uh, looked at the agreement between the baseline and the repeat FFQ, uh, the measurement error was random. So the people were either in the same um, quintile category in, uh, in the repeat assessment as the baseline, the same intake category, or in the adjacent category, either to the left or to the right. But the error is largely random. There was no systematic error, and that's really the key. So if the error is random, that would dilute associations with the null, which you can correct for if you get a repeat assessment in a subset and then correct for regression dilution bias. So there is no, there, there is no um, strong evidence, really, that uh, having get, if, you, if, you, if you were able to get a repeat dietary assessment, the results would change. Uh, I really see no strong evidence for that, in my opinion. But a, a lot of people don't disagree with that. Great. Andrew, I think we're going to wrap it up there. I just want to say thank you again uh, very much. I mean, hats off to you and, and your team for a really impressive, uh, uh, ambitious and impressive body of work. And, and thank you for taking the time to share it with our Dairy at Guelph group today. Um, as I said, we we. Uh, really appreciate the work. Uh, appreciate your time today, and uh, hopefully we can even uh, build out some some further connections between our our institutions because there's lots of people with uh, with shared interests here. So, again, thank you very much for doing this, and I'll oh, wrap yeah. things up there. My my pleasure, Stephen. And too bad we couldn't do it in person, but maybe one day in the future. <laughs> next time. Next yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thanks again, Andrew, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you.